we are working our way chapter and chapter, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse through the book of 1 Corinthians in the Bible. And so we have been doing this for a couple of years now, and we land today in the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is known far and wide as the love chapter, and it is a chapter that does a great testimony to what love really is. And as we noted before, Paul writes this not to husbands and wives, but to a church. And he says, this is the behavior that is supposed to characterize people who are followers of Jesus. Now, we also noted that there is application to husbands and wives, to how we love our children, to how we love one another. But it is written primarily to the church. Paul's arguing that to use a spiritual gift that is highly visible and life-changing means nothing if you don't have love. He has explained what love is in this passage. He has explained how it is supposed to operate. And now what he's going to tell us is why love is the more excellent way to live life. In the end of chapter 12, he said, look, Corinthians... You guys are searching for all these gifts that are going to get you attention, that are going to get you recognized. And he says, but I'm going to show you a more excellent way. And that's why our title today is Living with Excellence. Living with Excellence. How do we live with excellence? We do that by loving one another. Let's begin with prayer. Father, it is a privilege to preach and teach your word. It is a privilege to gather together as the body of Christ in freedom. And we recognize, Lord, that there are some who aren't able to be here because of sickness, and we ask for healing for them. But, Father, we rejoice in those who have gathered, those who have joined us via live stream, and we ask, Lord, that you would bless and guide our service. I know that, Father, in our hearts there are going to be the temptations to be distracted, to think about lunch, to think about the trials and difficulties of our lives. And Lord, I ask that through your Holy Spirit, you would set those fears, those concerns, those worries, that we would take them to the feet of Jesus, lay our burdens down, and be fed by the food of your word. And so I ask, Lord, that you would guide and direct this service today. In the precious name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. The passion of the Apostle Paul for the church is that we would not waste our time pursuing things that are useless, pursuing the accolades or the applause of men. We have a higher calling. We have an urgent task that we must never lose sight of. And so it's time we stop wasting time pursuing things that don't matter because we have something far more important to pursue. We pursue the advancement of the gospel. However, the advancement of the gospel is not possible apart from an excellent life of love. And so here in chapter 13, Paul is calling us to live with excellence. The excellent life is a life of love. So our principle is this, that to live with excellence, love is our most important priority. To live with excellence, love is our most important priority. And this this principle comes to us with guidance, and the guidance is this, that the priority of love is revealed through the pursuit of three goals. And that's what we're going to talk about, three goals. Because there's an outcome. When we live with excellence, we love well, and that love attracts people to Jesus. So three goals that we pursue as we live with excellence. Goal number one, a life of excellence pursues purpose. A life of excellence pursues purpose. Have you ever had a day where you wake up and you just lay in bed for a while 
And it seems like the longer you lay there, the less able you are to get up, right? Uh, I recently heard this described as a no-bones day because it's like your bones have disintegrated and you're just, just a puddle on your bed, right? And you can't get up and you can't get going. One of the things that Jess and I have noticed is that if you start your day without a plan for the day, it's like the day goes poof and disappears, right? If we're going to live lives of excellence... We have to live with purpose. This means that we need to pursue things that matter most. We need to pursue things that have eternal value. In the Corinthian church, the people to whom Paul wrote this letter, they had a problem. And the problem was they were pursuing the recognition of men. That's only temporary. That's short term. And Paul's encouragement to the Corinthian church and to us is to find purpose in what is permanent. Find purpose in what is permanent. And that's what he talks about here in verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Love never fails, Paul says. And then, what's the next word? Love never fails, what's the next word? But. But is a word of contrast. Why is it that love is a more excellent way to live? Because love never fails. And I can just hear the arguments that people made. Well, Paul, what about all these other awesome things? Paul, what about speaking in any language? Paul, what about knowing the future? Paul, what about knowing the deep things of the will of God? Paul says, those things are temporary. Prophecy, tongues, knowledge, they all change. Paul says, prophecy will fail. Tongues will cease. Knowledge will vanish away. These three gifts have in common that they are what are called revelatory gifts, meaning that God revealed himself and his will through these gifts. Where do we turn now if we want to learn about God and his will? To the word of God, right? Now, keep that in mind. That's important. But we want to do some definition here for a minute. Prophecies. Uh, We've looked at this word before. It's the idea of speaking from God, either in regards to the future or in regards to his will. In this context, it is specifically talking about foretelling the future. Paul says prophecies will fail. They will fail is the Greek word katargeo, and it means to abolish, to set aside, to wipe out, to be inactivated, to be or become idle, inoperative, or useless. They will fail. This Greek word is used both for the failure of prophecy and the vanishing of knowledge. It's the same word. Knowledge refers to specific revelation or insight from God. Now, both of these are going to be brought to an end. Okay? Knowledge and prophecy. Tongues refers to the supernatural ability to speak in languages not previously known. Now, we've talked about this before, but just to remind us, when you see the word tongues in Scripture, it is always a known, spoken, recognizable language. It's not gibberish. Okay? It is not ec- ecstatic speech. Okay? It is a known, recognized language. And Paul says here that this ability will cease. The ability to speak in tongues will cease. Cease is the Greek word poimeo, and it means to stop, to end. To have an end in a temporal, spatial, or quantitative sense. Okay? So they're going to cease. Tongues are going to gradually cease on their own. Now I want to read a quote from Dr. Christopher Cohn. And he says this, in chapter 13, verse 8, there are three revelatory sign gifts or functions. He says they're not specifically referred to as gifts in this context. Prophecy, tongues, and knowledge. Prophecy and knowledge both end the same way. They are done away. Prophecies in the plural and knowledge in the singular. The verb to put an end or to stop in both cases is passive voice, meaning that an outside force will end these abruptly. Tongues, on the other hand, will cease. This is in the middle voice, meaning that the subject is acting upon itself. Tongues will cease of themselves. Tongues is also the first of these three to go. Remember the contrast. Love never fails, but these other three will. 
Verses 9 through 11 discuss a specific event that brings the failing or limitation of knowledge and prophecy. And by the time that these events, this event happens, tongues have already ceased of, them, of themselves. Tongues are the least significant of these three revelatory sign gifts or functions. Remember that after the mention of tongues in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, it is never again mentioned during the remaining four years of the New Testament. So, you say, that's interesting, Pastor John. So what? Okay, here's what we're talking about. Do you hear a lot about tongues in our day today? There are whole denominations that are built around this idea that tongues are supposed to be spoken by every believer. And Paul says that's not the case. Okay? Paul says that tongues have ceased. And in chapter 14, Paul's going to say, even if they haven't ceased, this is the way that you need to use them. And we don't see that reflected in most of its usages today. There's a very important point to be made from the Greek words here. Christopher Cohn made this point, but I want us to see it. Before prophecy and knowledge are done away with, tongues will have already ceased. That's the construction in the Greek here. Okay? Tongues will have already ceased when whatever's going to end prophecy and knowledge comes on the scene. I want to ponder a couple of questions. If tongues are a vital part of the Christian life today, why are they never mentioned in any other epistle in the New Testament? Not once. You only find the tongues in Acts and in 1 Corinthians. Nowhere else. Why? Because they had already ceased by the time those other books were written. Okay? And because it's really not as important as some people make it out to be. Second question, why is there silence about tongues before the completion of the New Testament, right? So when Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians, there's 40 years before the New Testament was, was finished being written. And you don't hear anything about tongues in, those, in 40 years. Why not? Well, I would argue that it's because they had already ceased. Right? If we spend all our time on energy, here's Paul's point. If we're spending all our time and energy on things like tongues, prophecy, and knowledge, we are missing what's most important. Because what is most important? Love. Love. Love is what gives meaning to everything else. Paul is saying love is permanent. These other things aren't. You can't live with excellence if you're pursuing things that won't last. And so here is our lesson. A life of love has eternal value. Would you read that with me, please? A life of love has eternal value. So Paul is encouraging us to find purpose in what is permanent. Next, he challenges us to find purpose in what is perfect. Find purpose in what is perfect. Now, as we look at the construction here, verse 9 is how Paul is answering the questions he raised in verse 8. Okay, So verse 9 says this, chapter 13, verse 9. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. So why will prophecy and knowledge be ended? Because they are partial. Okay, This is a Greek word that is it's ekmeros, and it means a partial portion. So the knowledge and prophecy that they have right now in the Corinthian church is partial, Paul's saying. It's a partial portion of knowledge and prophecy. And there's something really important to the understanding of this passage, and that is this. The contrast Paul is making is between what is partial and what is complete. What is partial and what is complete. Once again, let me emphasize, Paul is explaining verse 8. Prophecy and knowledge are going to forcibly be ended by something. Tongues will cease on its own. Verse 10 explains what will end prophecy and knowledge. Look at verse 10. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 10. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. So there's something coming that Paul describes as something that is perfect, and it is going to end knowledge and prophecy. It will eliminate this need for them because they are partial. Now, I am of the opinion that this word perfect would be better translated complete. Okay? This is the uh, Greek word teleotes, and it means perfection, maturity, the state of being complete and without defect or blemish. So I think you should translate it complete. Why? Because Paul's giving a contrast. What is the opposite of partial? 
not perfect. The opposite of partial is complete. Partial, complete. Partial, total, right? Either one of those would work here. Perfect is not the opposite of partial. So complete is a legitimate translation of this word. What Paul is saying is this. When the complete comes, the partial will be done away. Since the purpose of knowledge and prophecy was the authentication of the, the ministry of the apostles, as well as this temporary revelation of God, then it would make sense that these things would pass on the scene, off the scene when God's full revelation in Scripture is given. The purpose of tongues was the authentication of the work of the Holy Spirit and His presence, as well as a sign against Israel. So again, it would make sense that it would pass off the scene when we have the completed Word of God. Now, for sake of clarity, I am going to mention that there are four other arguments about what the perfect or the complete is here. One, some believe it refers to the rapture. Some believe it refers to the maturing church. Some believe it refers to the second coming. And some believe it refers to the eternal state. My problem with, we're not going to take the time to go through each of those. My problem with them is that I don't believe they actually answer the question that Paul raises in the text. They don't fit what Paul presents here. So I conclude that the per perfect thing that ended prophecy and knowledge was the completed word of God. And as previously noted, before that came, tongues would have already passed off the scene. They were no longer present when that happened. So the only revelation of God and of his will that the believer needs is now contained in the 66 books that comprise his written word. This. If someone comes to you and they say, I have a new word from God, don't listen. <laughs> because if they tell you something that isn't in here, then it's not from God. And if they tell you something that's already in here, you don't need them to tell you. Does that make sense? It's, it's already here. <laughs> okay? God already gave it to us. So there is no new word from God. Okay? God has already revealed everything that he wants us to know. It is up to us to understand it. That's why we come on a Sunday so that I can explain what I've studied and worked on. It's why we have Bible studies in the church and theology classes and why we have a Bible reading plan and all these things that we have. Because we want you to understand Scripture. And then we want you to obey it, right? I have to obey it. I have to put it into practice. So before the completion of Scripture, knowledge and prophecy are partial. That's Paul's point. The Corinthian believers were desperate to have these gifts because they thought it would make them significant. They believed that if I have a gift that's really spectacular, it's going to give me purpose. Paul says, look, your purpose is found in the completed Word of God. Our purpose is found in the Word of God. This is where we find our purpose. A life of excellence is spent in pursuit of the complete, the Word of God. When we spend our time and energy on what is partial, it is simply foolish. So here's our lesson. Purpose is found in the pages of Scripture. Would you read that with me, please? Purpose is found in the pages of Scripture. If we want purpose, we need to know what God has told us to do, right? We need to live by his word. And so we find purpose in what is permanent, love, and what is perfect, the word of God. We're pursuing these three goals. We want to live with excellence. And to do that, first, we know that a life of excellence pursues purpose. Goal number two, a life of excellence pursues growth. A life of excellence pursues growth. As many of you know, Jess and I exercise on a regular basis, and being part of the health and fitness community the last couple of years has been really interesting, because when the pandemic first hit and they shut down the gyms, we went to the store to try to find some free weights, some weights to work out with, and it was like entering a desert wasteland, right? The exercise aisles in the store were just empty. There was nothing there. I think I saw a tumbleweed rolling down the aisle as the wind whistled through, maybe not, what was fascinating to me is to see the different responses that people had. There were those who said, well, the gyms are closed. Guess I can't work out. And they just did nothing. Right? And then there were others who said, wow, if I have to do nothing for months here, I need to get into shape. Right? And they started exercising and, and working out. Here's the point. Growth doesn't just happen. Right? 
Strength doesn't just appear. Health doesn't just happen to us. It has to be intentionally pursued. If you're going to get healthy, you don't get healthy by just saying, I want to get healthy. You have to put healthy disciplines into place in your life. The same is true spiritually. We have to have healthy spiritual disciplines as part of our life. We can't sit on the couch of life and expect to grow in our walk with Christ, right? Growth has to be pursued. Why? Why do we pursue growth? Paul gives us two reasons. Reason number one, we pursue growth because growth transforms. Growth transforms. Look at verse 11. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, at first glance, this verse seems really out of place. Okay, Paul, you were talking about love and how knowledge and prophecy and tongues are going to cease. Love is more excellent. And then you're talking about growing up and maturity. Why? Because how we speak and understand and think changes as we mature. Love, on the other hand, deepens and broadens as we mature. Before I had kids, you would think to yourself, like, how could I ever, like, I love my wife, I love Jess so much, how could I ever have any love, extra love for a child, right? And then you have a child, then your love doesn't change, right? It grows to include that child, and then in our case, several more, right? As before, we need to understand, Paul's explaining verse 8, Love never fails. These other things are going to fail. Why do they end? Because they're partial, right? Love is better. In this verse, Paul is using the illustration of immaturity to explain why these things are going to pass off the scene. So he says, I spoke as a child. That's in a parallel to tongues. Here's what Paul is saying. The idea here is that speaking in tongues is for the spiritually immature. That's what Paul is saying. It's like speaking like a child. He says, when you mature, you're going to put that aside. You're going, to, you're going to stop doing that. To speak scripture is to speak with maturity. And this is going to be borne out in chapter 14. Because in chapter 14, Paul's going to say, look, I would rather say five words that someone can understand than 10,000 words in a language they don't know. This is Paul's point. Now, the word understood, he says, I understood as a child, that parallels knowledge. And he says, I thought as a child, that parallels prophecy. The parallels in this verse are too strong to, to ignore. Here's the comparison Paul is making, and it's a, it seems a little bit harsh, so bear with me. Paul is comparing tongues, prophecy, and knowledge to childish, infantile things. That's what he's saying. Those are the immature things. Those aren't the things you want to spend your life on. You want to grow up and move past those things. Now, again, I'm not making this comparison, okay? This isn't Pastor John, this is Paul. I'm just telling you what he's saying, all right? This is a comparison statement. This is the childish and the immature versus the mature. As, our, as children, our ability to speak is partial, as is our knowledge and understanding. And when we mature, we put aside those partial things. Put away is the same Greek word that Paul used of prophecy and knowledge in verse 8. When we mature, when we reach complete manhood or womanhood, we get rid of childish things. This is a process of transformation. We're transforming from child to adult. That's what growth does. The implication is this. To focus on prophecy, knowledge, and tongues is to remain immature. It is, it is to follow after the lesser things of Christ. And Paul's saying, put that away. Far more important, Paul says, is to love others well. Love is something that we learn as we grow. As we mature in Christ, we set aside the partial things, we set aside the immature things, and we grow and transform into those who are willing to love the unlovely, into those who are willing to serve without notice. And so here's our lesson. As we grow and transform, we learn to prioritize. We learn to prioritize. Read that with me, please. As we grow and transform, we learn to prioritize. The things that the Corinthian believers had been focusing on, Paul says, look, that's immature. Now remember, all the way back at the beginning of the book, what were they saying? The Corinthians were saying, well, I am of Paul. Well, I am of Apollos. Well, I follow Peter. Well, I just follow Christ, right? 
These are the attitudes that they had. And, and Paul's saying, look, these are sinful attitudes. And then we get to chapter 6, and we find out that they're taking each other to court over meaningless, simple things. And Paul says, what's going on? Why are you doing this? There's immaturity in the Corinthian church. Paul says to focus on these gifts is, is immature. He says focus on love, loving one another. So two reasons that we are to pursue growth. Number one, pursue growth because growth transforms. Number two, pursue growth because growth teaches. Growth teaches. Chapter 13, verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. This verse is really easy to misunderstand, okay? So we're going to begin by asking a very important question. And that question is this. What do you look at in a mirror? Anyone? Yourself. Good. You look at yourself in a mirror. If you look in the mirror and you don't see yourself, we have a problem. So you, when you look in the mirror, you're to see yourself. This is not referring to seeing Christ face to face. Okay, That's not what this is talking about. It's talking about seeing yourself clearly. Okay, So this is talking about our knowledge of self. When Scripture comes, it reveals who we really are. Scripture exposes ourselves. We do not see ourselves clearly apart from Scripture. What, do we, what is the lie we tell ourselves? I'm an okay guy. I'm pretty good. And then we come to Scripture, and Scripture says, There is none righteous, no, not one. Ha! Huh. All your righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Whoa! Scripture reveals who we really are. Scripture is the clear image. When I look at myself, I see dimly. <laughs> I go, well, eh, I'm not too bad. I'm better than that guy, right? When we look at Scripture, Scripture says, leaves us no room to say that. Scripture says, nope, you are not. You're not okay. You need a Savior. Huh, who is that? Jesus Christ. Hebrews 4.12 tells us this, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Has anyone else ever been reading a passage of Scripture and just felt it slice you right open? It reveals what's going on inside of us, doesn't it? And we go, ouch! Put that away, right? It's a dangerous weapon. That's Paul's point. He says, but then face to face. Then means at that time. At what time? When the complete comes. What's complete? This. This is the complete, remember? So right now, Paul says, we don't have the completed word of God when he was writing it. Okay, we do today. And he said, we, we see in a mirror dimly. We don't see clearly. But when the completed revelation of God comes, it's like seeing face to face in the mirror. It is partial, our human understanding. He says, we know in part. It is, again, ekmeros. When Scripture comes, we know fully. This comes as we grow in the Christian life. The Word of God is the food that nourishes our spiritual life. It grows us. 1 Peter 2.2 2 says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. This is where we start. Just like in the physical life, we start with milk. We start with the easy to digest things. And as we learn the, the basic truths of scripture, as we grow in them, we move past them to the more difficult things. Hebrews 5.13 and 14 says, For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. What he's saying is we, we need the milk, right? That grows us, that nourishes us, that matures us. But then we move past that, right, when we've cut our spiritual teeth and we're able to tackle the things that are more difficult. 
The problem is, just like in life, we like the candy bars. I like the things in Scripture like, I will never leave you or forsake you. Who I love that one. That's, that's like a candy bar, right? More difficult are the ones that said, now this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Now that's meaty. That takes work to chew on, right? This is, this is how they will, you'll know that you are my disciples by your love one for another. Ah, that's meaty. We got to chew on that for a while, right? As the word of God grows and matures us, we learn about ourselves. The word of God teaches us discernment. It teaches us how to live for Christ. And so here is our lesson. To know ourselves fully, we must know God's word. Read that with me, please. To know ourselves fully, we must know God's word. We cannot live with excellence. We can't live with love if we don't even know ourselves. God's word exposes areas of weakness and strength. It reveals what we need to work on, what we need to grow in, as well as where we are strong. So we pursue growth because growth transforms and it teaches. Our three goals, goal number one, a life of excellence pursues purpose. Goal number two, a life of excellence pursues growth. Goal number three, a life of excellence pursues excellence. That might sound a little redundant. Let me explain. Excellence doesn't just happen. Several weeks ago, I mentioned my son Andrew's love of monster trucks and motorcycles. The guys who drive monster trucks and ride motorcycles don't become professionals by accident. Okay? It takes a lot of hard work, usually a lot of injuries as well, uh, to get to that level. Recently, I was teaching one of our kids how to skateboard. I didn't learn how to do that overnight. Right? It, took, it took weeks and months and years of work to ride a skateboard well. Welders continually strive to improve. Painters constantly hone their craft. Politicians train to tell better lies. I'm kidding. Just kidding. <clears throat> there has to be a little bit of, of uh, release there. Okay. The point is this. If we want excellence, we have to work towards that goal, right? Verse 13 teaches us two truths about excellence. Truth number one, excellence progresses. Excellence progresses. Paul says in verse 13, And now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now abide faith, hope, and love. I believe Paul's intention here is to show us what we need to pursue. He says, don't pursue tongues, prophecy, or knowledge. Those were, are going to fade. Those are going to end. Instead, pursue faith, hope, and love. Faith reflects both our belief and what we believe in, right? It means I believe, and these are the truths, the faith that I hold to. We have faith, and we hold to the faith. Hope is the confident expectation that God will do what he has promised. That is our hope. And love is agape here, and it means to, it is unconditional love. We are to demonstrate the same unconditional love that we are given by God. So faith, hope, and love, these are qualities, right? And faith and hope are comparable to love. So go with me to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. Paul lists several, Paul, Peter, that's why we're in Peter. Second Peter, chapter 1, Peter lists for us some things that we are to pursue. Second Peter, chapter 1, verse 5. But also, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Peter says, these are the things you need to pursue. Faith, virtue, and he's saying you add to it. You're growing. It's a maturing process that we are going through. 
we are, not, we are not to seek after just one particular gift, like the Corinthians were. We are to seek to grow, to progress in our maturity, in our faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith and hope go together. We believe, right? That's faith. And so we're confident, that's hope, that God will do what he has promised. In Galatians 5, 22 and 23, we find out that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Okay? That is what a life of excellence looks like. <laughs> it is growth in these qualities. And so here is our lesson in the beginning of verse 13. A life of excellence demands submission to the Holy Spirit. Would you read that with me, please? A life of excellence demands submission to the to the Holy Spirit. We cannot grow if we're trying to do things our own way. It's not possible. If we are not growing, we are not living with excellence. So two truths about excellence. Number one, excellence progresses. Number two, excellence prioritizes. Excellence prioritizes. Verse 13, once again, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13. And now abide faith, hope, Love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. The greatest thing that we can do as the body of Christ, Paul says, is to love one another. John said, Beloved, love one another. For everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not knows not God because God is love. We need to love one another. Jesus told his disciples, John 13, 35, they will know you are my disciples by your arguing and bickering. And nope, that's not what it says. They will know you are my disciples by your love one for another. Here's the bottom line. If we do not love one another, we fail to be true disciples of Jesus. When it comes to love, we have never arrived. There is never going to come a moment where I'm going to be like, yeah, I love everyone perfectly. That's not going to happen, all right? I can always love more and better. And this is a vital truth to take into all of our relationships. I can love better as a friend. I can love better as a father. I can love better as a husband. What is it about love that makes it Better, he says, the greatest of these is love. What, is, what makes it greater than faith and hope? Because one day, maybe soon, faith will become sight. Jesus is going to return. We're going to be caught up to be with him, and we're not going to need faith anymore because we're going to be in the presence of Jesus. Faith is going to end, right? In his presence, our hope, our confident expectation will be a fully realized reality. I am no longer going to have to look forward to God keeping his promises because I'm going to be experiencing him keeping them. So hope, too, will be done away with. What about love? Love will remain because we will abide in the love of Christ for eternity. So why is love greater? Because it's eternal, brothers and sisters. Faith is going to become sight. Hope is going to be realized. Love is eternal. It endures forever. So in light of that reality, what should we pursue? What should be our priority? Should we spend our time and energy on things that are temporary and fleeting, or should we spend our time and energy in pursuit of what is eternal? Here's our lesson. A life of excellence knows that love is our top priority. Would you read that with me, please? A life of excellence knows that love is our top priority. So how are we doing in our love? Do we love people like Christ. Here's Paul's whole point. Until we learn to love, our spiritual gifts are useless. Worse than that, they're potentially damaging if we're using them without love. Tongues doesn't matter if you don't love the people you're talking to. (laughs) Prophecy is useless if you don't care about the people. Knowledge benefits no one if it isn't shared without love. If you have truly been transformed by Christ, if we have embraced his purpose, if we are pursuing a life of excellence, 
We must be the most loving people there are, period. And so, here's our commitment today. I'll submit to the Holy Spirit and love like Jesus. So I'm going to ask you to read this, but only read it if this is a commitment that you are willing to make. Okay, here we go. I will submit to the Holy Spirit and love like Jesus. What does that mean? Well, let's break it down. To submit to the Holy Spirit means we obey His word. If Scripture says no, whatever it is, that's a no for us. If Scripture says yes, whatever it is, that's a yes for us. To love like Jesus means that our first consideration is not how much someone deserves love. Now, we want that to be the metric by which our love is given, don't we? We want to say, well, have you earned my love yet? That's not loving like Jesus. Our first consideration is how much someone needs love. Have you ever met someone who didn't need love? Huh, me either. (laughs) They may think they don't, but everyone needs love because love is vital. In our friendships, we can't represent Christ to people if we don't love. In our church relationships, how we love one another is being carefully observed by a world apart from Christ. What do they see in the church? In our parenting, our children need to know that we love them more than they need to know anything else. Believe me, they know when they've made mistakes. Didn't you when you were a kid? You knew when you made a mistake. They know when they're not measuring up to your standards, didn't you? Right? What they need to know is that you love them anyway. Even when they mess up, even when they don't measure up, they need to know that you love them. In our marriages, love will make or break a marriage. We love one another. We respect one another regardless of performance. What does that mean? It means even when your husband or wife is not doing what you think they should, you choose to love and respect them anyway. Hmm. That's what it means to love like Jesus. Four thoughts and we close. Our purpose is to show the love of Christ and represent him well. That is what we're supposed to do. And so in the Christian life, Growth cannot happen apart from Scripture. We can't love people unless we are who we need to be. And we cannot be who we need to be if we are not men and women of the Word of God. We only live with excellence when we love others. You could know this cover to cover, but Paul says if you don't love, what did, what did we talk about recently? You're a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Take two symbols, bang them together. That's what we're like without love. An annoying, empty, awful sound. So, believe the word of God, hope in God's promises, and most of all, love others with a genuine love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today. I thank you for each person who is here, whether they're in person, whether they're watching the live stream, or whether they're watching this later. Father, it is our desire that each person, each follower of Jesus, learn to live as he would have us live. Learn to walk as he would have us walk. Father, we're not going to do that magically, We're going to do that through hard work, perseverance, and dedication. May we be disciplined as we take in the word of God, and may it change our lives. Father, I ask that this week we would love better. We know we're not going to be perfect in our love, but may our love look a little bit more like Jesus this week than it did last week. We ask, Father, that this week also everything we do, everything we say, and everything we think would bring praise and honor and glory to you in your name. We pray this in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen.